So I wrote out a ton of notes today on things that I wanted to say. And then Jamie and I, who haven't met in person until today, but we Skyped a lot, and um, Jamie wrote the forward to the new edition, and I wrote a new introduction. And we just got to talking, and so I'm leaving my notes on this table here. And we decided to just have a conversation uh, from her point of view and from mine. But I do want to say something at the top. That three, there's three things that have made it, that sort of, that forced Larry Nasser and USA Gymnastics to be held accountable. Two, our newspapers, and the other is the 300 and counting girls and young women with the courage to step, to step up and tell their truth. The first newspaper was the San Francisco Examiner, and Glenn Schwartz, my sports editor at the time, is here, and I want to give him the credit for this book. It grew out of a series of articles that Glenn and I brainstormed together a million years ago. Um, on it, it was about young girls who are the best in the world at what they do w before they're old enough to have their driver's license. And then that led to eventually this, this book. So thank you, Glenn, for being certainly the best editor I ever worked for. And then the second newspaper is the Indianapolis Star, and I, who broke the stories um, about abusive coaches. And then that led to Rachel Dellenhollander, who read the story in, um, she was in Louisville, she read the story, and she came forward, called the newspaper, and said, I know you're writing about coaches, but I have a story about a doctor. And she filed suit, I think, late August in um, 2016. And 10 days later, and 2,200 miles away, Jamie became the first, certainly the first Olympian to step forward, and the first one to file a civil suit against Nasser and USA, right? Oh, yeah, I believe so. Yeah. I also, I hadn't read, when I came forward, I hadn't read uh, Rachel's article either. So I didn't even know at right. that point that she existed. Right, right. So that set in motion <coughs> this cascade of events that led to those eight days in January of this year where gymnasts, I think originally it was supposed to be like 70 some <coughs> gymnasts to testify, um, not to testify, but to speak at the sentencing hearing of Larry Nasser. And because it was carried live on CNN, other gymnasts saw it, and soon they began arriving from all over the country. And by the time it was over, there was 156, <coughs> I think, who stood up and said, and they, they became an army and a force. Um, so, in a way, you know, every author wants their book to have staying power. And so I have really mixed feelings that this book is reissued. Um, because the only reason it's reissued is because of what happened. And this book answers the question that everybody has asked, how could this have happened? So Jamie and I figured out that when my book came out in 1995, you were, how old? I was 13. Mm -hmm. And already an elite gymnast. So tell us what your life was like at the time when I had documented the emotional, um, physical abuse <clears throat> that went on in <laughs> among every elite gymnast in the country, and Jamie was one of them. Well, I started training late when I was 11 years old. Um, and I guess by the time I was 13 and Little Girls in Pretty Boxes came out, um, I didn't I didn't read it, and honestly, I can say I wouldn't even have been allowed to read it because the USA Gymnastics and people in gymnastics, they, they hated John Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> and 
So I, I didn't read it at the time, I just heard nothing but negative things about it. And having already been training in Elite for two years at the time, um, I, was, I was in it. I was, um, it was abuse every single day of my life. Uh, my coaches would yell at me, um, scream at me, tell me I was never good enough, I never worked hard enough. They would weigh me every day. They would tell me I needed to lose weight. They would tell me what to eat and not to eat. Uh, we trained 35 to 40 hours a week on top of going to school. And my, my personal coaches actually wanted me to homeschool. And fortunately, my parents supported the fact that I wanted to go to college. And um, so my coaches were, I think they made it even harder on me because I chose to go to school and keep my eligibility for college, which later I learned was the number one reason for that was because they, you know, they wanted me to take money early on so they could make money from me. Um, so reading through the book, how many years was this later? 23. Oh my God, 23 years later. <laughs> It's it's a, it's astonishing. Sorry, I just spilled this. Okay. <laughs> um, it's crazy because so much of it that I read is not only heartbreaking, but that's exactly what I was going through uh, my whole elite career. Mm -hmm. So, at the time that so, how old were you when you met Larry Nassar? Uh, I was either 12 or 13. I believe I was 12. Um, but, because I, I made national team in 1994 when I was just 12 years old, so the, the junior national team. And I remember him um, being there. We had to get like all the, like a physical, we had to get MRIs and x-rays and, um, and he, Larry Nassar gave me my physical at that training camp and molested me the first day I actually met him. And I remember being so excited to be on national team, and I actually, uh, the other thing that's, I, I don't wanna say cool about the book, but it's kinda cool because a lot, of, a lot of the gymnasts that I looked up to when I was younger are in the book, like Betty Okino. Mm -hmm. I remember Shelly Stack, I remember Hillary Gribbage and Kim Zemeskel, so um, I was so excited to be on national team Yet, the way it was kind of set up, it was you know, it was based on a lot of fear. And so even though I was excited and I was definitely afraid of all the national staff there. I mean, it, it, it was scary. And Larry Nassar was pretty much the only nice adult around us. Uh, he, would, he would sneak us food and candy because they would basically starve us. And it was like we were, we were allowed to smile and laugh with him, which is something we aren't allowed to do in the gym when we were training, uh, even talking. So I, I would describe it as Larry kind of became my buddy. And um, I was discussing as this is now, I actually looked forward to my treatments with, with Larry just because, like I said, I could, felt like I kind of relax and be myself for a little bit. Mm -hmm. It would just be a child. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the answers to, like, how could this have happened? And also, yeah, how could this guy get away with molesting girls for 20-something years? The culture of gymnastics is a culture of abuse. And one way that plays itself out is that, and, and you, know, you certainly went through this, is that you're already starving and your coach is telling you you eat too much and you're fat. You're in incredible pain, you're injured, and your coach is telling you you're lazy, get back up on the balance beam. Um, you know, that you're exhausted, and your coach is telling you, you know, you're just a loser and a malingerer. So when that happens, and you're a young girl, any child, over and over and over, you're, tell, you're told that your reality is not real. 
and in order to survive in gymnastics, elite gymnastics, you had to deny, you had to buy into your coach's reality, therefore denying your own. So when somebody, a predator like Larry Nasser comes along, and you may feel like uncomfortable even though he's saying this is a medical treatment, you're going to deny that reality of being uncomfortable because this adult is telling you it's a medical treatment and if you ever said anything, as some, you know, a few gymnasts did, they were told, well, you don't know the difference between molestation and a medical treatment. And this guy was so revered, like you said, the gymnasts were so, um, so proud and, and felt so grateful that this famous gymnastics physician was now treating you. Was that your experience? Uh, yeah, it's exactly that, except I, I never really felt, I personally never felt uncomfortable. Uh, I think he had already groomed me from so young. And for me, I was, I was just starving for any kind of positive feedback. So, like I said, I, I, no, he's a doctor, too. So meeting the national team, USA Gymnastics doctor, it was a privilege to be working with him. And it was a privilege to be working with the national team staff. And why would I question that? And also, it's, the only, it's our only route to get to the Olympics. Our, our dream was in their hands. And it would come down to, okay, I either, you know, do what they say, or I quit. And I knew I, I, would, regret, I would regret quitting, or I would always question that for the rest of my life. So that was our own, that my only path to my Olympic dream was doing the things they said. Mm -hmm. And like I said, Larry Nassar was the positive adult around me, so I never even questioned what he was doing because I really believed that he was trying to help me mm -hmm. so that I could compete. Right, and that's typical grooming of a, of a predator, right? So when did, it, when did you realize that it was sexual abuse? Uh, I didn't realize till August, like, when, when were the Olympic, Olympic trials in San Jose, right? Yeah, 2016. Yeah, it was 2016, so I didn't realize. I mean, yeah, yeah it was this 2016. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, 2016. Um, until late August 2016. And in, in my case, I had um, one of my good friends who I met in San Diego and I was coaching with her at the time. She was telling me that she was sexually abused by her personal coach. And I remember just being like, I'm so sorry, I can't relate. Because I, I didn't even realize I was sexually abused. And I think over time... Um, she had asked me actually to have a conversation with, with the coach one day when I was working at a camp right before Olympic trials. And I think what triggered mine is when I said her stuff out loud and when I told somebody else finally about it, I think I was like, well, wait a minute, that's like what this doctor used to do to me. And he was like, well, which doctor? And I was like, well, no, I don't want to say. Everybody loves this guy. Um, and it took me a little bit of time to tell him, but I finally told him it was Dr. Nasser, and he said that I need to tell somebody else, and, um, I went to Olympic trials that weekend, and I really just went to have fun. I didn't really want to see anybody but some of my, um, my old teammates. So I went to Olympic trials, and I asked a couple people if it had happened to them, and, Dominique Mochiano was on was actually one of them, and she said it had never happened to her, but she's the one that got me in touch with the right people to kind of get this rolling. And when my article finally came out in 2016, September, I believe, 2016, um, USA Gymnastics attacked me. Uh, people in the gymnastics community attacked me on social media. People are sending messages, trying to find positive Larry stories, telling people that I was lying, that I just wanted attention because I actually failed at the Olympic Games. And um, they, were, they were pretty awful to me, but um, I knew that had he, had he done this to any one of my nieces or nephews, or had he had done what he did to me to 
any one of the little girls I was coaching at the time, that that's what made me go through with it. And I was, if I could protect one child, then I need to speak the truth. And you started out as a Jane Doe. Why did you do that rather than have your name attached to it right from the start? I think because I was, I was afraid of the negativity and the, you know, the response. And that's, that's how I was brought up in the sport. And I, I don't, I think, and I was still coaching at the time too, so um, I had no idea, you know, it was going to go in the direction it did. I just, yeah, I guess I didn't want my name out there. I mean, I was actually outed on Facebook too. Like someone outed me as Jamie Dancher instead of Jane Doe. Um, I guess I was prepared for it in some ways, but I wasn't prepared for how negative it was and some of the awful things that people said about me. And also learning who my real friends were real fast, because some of the people I thought were my friends in gymnastics didn't believe me. Um, and you had kind of an experience with that in the 2000 Olympics. When and this made me a fan of Jamie's way before I knew her and way before I so Jamie is Brandon Crawford's sister-in-law so and I work for the Giants and um, did they so, win today? Um, yeah. yeah, is it over? Did they win? What's the number? <laughs> they won. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. All right, they won. We're happy about that. But um, but I knew Jamie of Jamie from, she was the first Olympic gymnast I ever heard criticize Bella Caroli. And she spoke up, and she got her head knocked off. And by very respected journalists and one columnist who's a good friend, you know, who's a friend of all of ours, and, uh, and she went after you um, about this. And I was just like, I knew what it took for you to speak up, and you just got such a blowback from everybody, and I'll, I mean, I'll always admire that, but, you know, you kind of knew what was going to come this time when you spoke up, too, from yeah, the gymnastics exactly. community. Yeah, because I did speak up in 2000, and um, my experience at the Olympic Games was um, actually pretty awful. Besides representing my country and feeling like my dream come true, the actual... Um, experience was very difficult and Larry Nassar was there as well and we didn't stay in the village we, we had to stay in this uh, secluded college all by ourselves with just the coaches and um, I mean the, the same story just abusive no days off just non-stop training they basically set up a meet a competition for us twice a day in training and then I ended up rolling my ankle on podium training, and so I couldn't finish. And Bella and Marta used that to take me off bars, the event bars. And I was co-head champion, like national team champion on bars that year. And so I couldn't understand why they took me off bars when I was the national champion. And I found out in warm-ups what I was competing at the Olympic Games when we were warming up to compete. And, yeah, I, I remember saying, like, Bella, they kind of, you know, they came in at last minute, like they're trying to save the 2000 team after we came in sixth at 1999 World Championships. And so they kind of brought them in, like they were going to save us all. And um, because, we, because we didn't end up winning, they kind of blamed it on all of us. And that's kind of what I said in the article is, you know, they, they take credit when we're successful and then they, they blame everyone else when we're not. Mm -hmm. So let's move on to USA Gymnastics. How much do you hold them accountable for this? And, and I, I ask that because generally the gymnasts are training in their own gyms with their own coaches. So what role should USA Gymnastics have played in this, given that you know, you're training fairly remotely from them? Well, I think they're, they should be held very accountable because they're the ones making the rule books and having their own policies. And you know, that's who every individual gym pays 
You have to be a USA Gymnastics member. You have to pay USA Gymnastics in order to compete to make USA national team. So they're very accountable. And, and the abuse and the mentality of, of the culture in gymnastics is, you know, they're very responsible for it. Um, how long was, was Steve Penny president? And, I mean, we're not even talking about Larry Nassar. We're talking about other sexual predators who had been allowed to stay in gymnastics and for a long time. I mean, I mean, one was raping girls in the back of his van, raping 15-year-olds, taking them to practice, and then he was still named the Olympic coach. And, I mean, this has been going back for so many years, and they just, they just didn't care. And that's what it comes down to. They didn't care. Um, and they still don't. They're still trying to cover it up and move on and acting like they're making changes. And I truly believe they need to be completely decertified. And that's what our fight is right now, is we're really trying to put pressure on Congress to put pressure on the USOC to decertify them and start all over and come up with a new system that cares more about children's safety than money and medals. So um, I, I do want to share this with everyone. So when my book came, well, when I was researching the book, USA Gymnastics basically wouldn't speak to me. But there was one woman who did, Nancy Tease Marshall. And she was sort of, she was a former gymnast who was the athlete representative on the board. And she was uh, given the responsibility of coming up with a program to keep the sport safe. So she did. She so she you know did some preliminary research, put something together, and then they gave her some money to put together an actual manual. So she put together this um, athlete wellness book that was um, you know lauded by USA Gymnastics, and she went and spoke to conferences on safe sport and and all the rest of it. So when the second edition of this book came out in 2000, five years after the first, I was, you know, cautiously optimistic because of Nancy. No other reason, but just, just because of Nancy. Because guess what? I mean, this was the first thing I'd ever seen from USA Gymnastics that was addressing um, coaching abuse, eating disorders, all of that. I was like, wow, this is, this is pretty amazing. So, you know, the second edition came out and... And frankly, you know, I ran as fast as I could from gymnastics and just never really <laughs> looked at it again. So now this whole thing happens. And the book is going to be reissued. And, and I can't tell you the fury I felt when this all happened. Because 23 years ago, it was all in the book. There's no way USA, USA Gymnastics could ever claim they didn't know that this culture of abuse happened. And there were allusions to sexual abuse, but none of the gymnasts were going to come forward at that time. So anyway, I thought, I gotta find out what happened to this manual and Nancy T. is Marshall. So I tracked her down and I called her and she's uh, human resources, head of human resources for a small Christian college in the Pacific Northwest. And I got her phone number, I called, and I said, Nancy, this is Joan Ryan. And there was just this kind of pause and an exhale of breath. And she said uh, something like, I was wondering when you were going to call me. <laughs> and I said, what happened? You just, you know, USA Gymnastics seemed like they were moving forward. And she said, it I think it was right when the book came out, 2000, she said that the um, higher-ups at USA Gymnastics told her, yeah, they, well, they cut the budget in half for her program. Then they said, you know, we really like the program. They sent her out to speak at conferences, so it looked like, you know, they were doing the right thing. And they told her, just, um, just deal with the youth, the, the young kids but stay away from the national team. Ooh. And I said, you yeah. know, so she, we talked about this, and so I said, Nancy, you know, I don't have, you know, all my research is somewhere, I don't even know where it is. So I said, I, you know, can you send this to me? Again, so, you know, 
in the mail, open up a package, and here it is. And I'm flipping through it and reminded, you know, how thorough it was. And then I get to the forward. And it's, um, you know, those of us on the healthcare administrative staff are proud to be working with young men and women drawn to this sport. Um, you know, how important it is to keep our athletes safe, blah, 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 blah. Written by Larry Nassar. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So that's how embedded and how much he was um, admired and um, his stature in USA Gymnastics. So it just shows how insidious, it's almost like, it's like a cult. It's like, yeah. it's like a cult, it really is. It's like a it's cult. So yeah, I know. There's so many of them that go along with it. Yeah, and it is kind of a mom and pop shop. And that's what, you know, this whole new board, you know, because they, they got rid of the entire board. Now they have a new board and it's not everybody who has a financial stake in making sure gymnasts win it's also making sure they're safe as they do it. And one of the new board members, if a lot of you in here know her, is Stacy Slaughter from the Giants, who's one of the great people. Um, she's you know, uh, executive vice president of the Giants, and she's on it, knows nothing about gymnastics, and a lot of the people they brought on the board know nothing about gymnastics. All they care about is the athletes. And so I feel confident for two reasons that this time, unlike 23 years ago, things are going to change. One is, if the rest of the board is like Stacy, I feel really good they're going to make some good decisions. Um, but I think they need to clear out the staff, for sure. And number two, <laughs> having gotten to know the gymnasts the way I did in, in researching this book, there is no way that an army of elite gymnasts are going to stop until the job is done. The drive that made them elite gymnasts, now they've turned to USA Gymnastics and the USOC. You know, that's an army that is going to be formidable, and I know you guys are not going to stop until it's changed. No, we're not. We're not stopping. Yeah. We're not. We're not. We're not. We're not. <laughs>
And when you look at some of that, I mean, especially the Chinese gymnasts, I mean, they're freakishly little. I mean, it's what the, our gymnasts look like, you know, some years ago. So you think something is wrong there. Yeah. I would like to contribute to the answer. I was on the Ukrainian Olympic ah. Reserve, and I'm a little nervous speaking right now, because my heart just started beating when you were starting answering. And um, the trauma, I was in the rhythm gymnastics, oh. the abuse for sure of all the mental and psychological. The sexual piece, we didn't have male coaches or male doctors, mm -hmm. it was mostly female. I didn't experience the sexual piece, but I think um, things will be coming up now that the U.S. is leading the way of opening the Pandora box of all the other abuses. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely other countries have similar flavor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So is your thinking that, um, that, is that what you're saying, that other countries will sort of, the, the women and gymnasts there may feel empowered to step forward because of what's happening here? In Ukraine, you know, my, my teammates, this was 1996, my teammate won the Atlanta Olympics. And um, in general, now when I go back every year to visit my parents and everyone, and they're training the next wave of gymnasts, and they're just forwarding the same style of training to the next generation, the women themselves, we're not as empowered in other parts of the world to have our voices heard. Mm -hmm. America is one of the few countries mm -hmm. in the world leading that way. Mm -hmm. Well, that's really wonderful to hear and, and hopeful, and all the sacrifices that you guys are making and the hits you take and having to tell your story over. I mean, how many times have you been to Washington, D.C.? Um, so, I don't know, like seven. I like, know everybody at the hotel. Is <laughs> that <laughs> <laughs> so, Frank? Like, yeah. like seven in the last six months, maybe. Yeah. In New York. and yeah. You know, one central question, and this always comes up, is can you, in gymnastics, given the level of expertise and perfection and, I mean, <sighs> such high risk-taking um, skills that you need to be at the highest level of, of gymnastics and they keep pushing the envelope year after year, can you do it in a way that's healthy and still win? I personally believe so, yes. And when I I went to uh, UCLA and competed there for four years, and there was no mental, emotional, physical abuse um, or sexual abuse, and and we won a lot. I mean, we won three out of four national championships, and um, I think I won four individual. And I mean, I think people would argue that you know you're adults at this point, but I know for me personally, training had I been treated with more respect and less abuse, I think I could have been a lot more successful as an elite athlete. Mm -hmm. What is it, and we talked a little bit about this, Mike, what's the lasting impact of what you went through for all of those years? Well, given with um, realizing that I was sexually abused on top of everything else, that's kind of what I said in in some of the interviews is kind of like added to the list of abuse and it's it's been a struggle it's definitely bringing up you know a lot a lot of things in therapy that i i don't really want to face and it's also making sense for how my adult life has kind of gone and i i am getting better but it definitely has a lasting impact, and I think I'll have to be working on a lot of these things probably for the rest of my life. And one of them, you had an eating disorder. Oh, yeah, I was anorexic and bulimic for a lot of years. And how early did that start? Um, I started making myself throw up when I was 15. And, I mean, starving myself all the time, but I was diagnosed more when I was in in college, but that was definitely from from training elite. Mm -hmm. And did all the gymnasts share that information, or were you kind of do, doing it in isolation? Um, at, as an elite, yeah, it was definitely isolated. I didn't know. I think we all kind of was like unspoken, knowing that we're all kind of 
going through the same things, but at the same time, we were also fighting for the same spot. And it was al it was almost like another competition with, I know some of the girls, like, you know, who's the skinniest or the, you know, the lightest, or doing exactly what the coaches say. Um, yeah, I remember telling Kathy Kelly, like, that I started making myself throw up, and I was so, it was, like, so traumatic for me to make myself do that. And she said, we don't care how you do it, just lose the weight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, other questions? Yeah, jo Joan, you said you're feeling positive about the reconstituted board. She's spending her time trying to get Congress to blow it up. Have you two talked about your yeah. difference, of, <laughs> difference of opinion on the approach here? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that USA Gymnastics is going in the right direction in that. Maybe it's not enough. I don't know. Um, I think the staff totally has to change. And is it going to be better? Like, if you decertify it and start over, um, you know, maybe it would be better. Well, do you, why do you feel strongly about just raising it, you know, just... Uh, I, just I, th I think it'll be too difficult to weed out um, all the people that have the same mentality. Mm -hmm. And I think a new system has to be put in place. I don't know how to do that or what that looks like, but I think it needs to start over and that doesn't mean that you know that USA Gymnastics is not going in the right direction um, but we definitely need a new system in place to make change to keep kids safer because otherwise we still have gyms all over the US with this same mentality and I mean I'm, I'm talking about abusing kids even at level three now and little six-year-olds that are like getting screamed at and yelled at and it's the mentalities all over the US mm -hmm. so I just think they need to be decertified and you know, yeah, making sure there's a better system in yeah. place. I mean, I think we both agree that they need to have a whole new system in place. And one of the things, and tell me if you think this makes sense, is that to have regional advocates that maybe aren't even former gymnasts, have nothing to do with gymnastics, but are just child safety advocates that any gymnast could speak to totally confidentially, and they randomly check in on the gyms because this is the problem mm -hmm. you know yeah. like the gyms are so far away from Indianapolis where the headquarters are for USA Gymnastics that USA Gymnastics can make all the rules they want but they don't know what's going on in the gyms yeah no I definitely agree it's one, one of the things I wanted to do um, when this you know keeps moving forward I guess is kind of go around to all the different gyms and educate the gym owners and the parents and, and even even the kids about what abuse is and what to look for with all kinds of abuse. And we did, that's actually something I brought up when I was, um, when I was at Congress and actually I brought up to them is the idea of maybe having representatives from other sports mm. checking in on the gyms so that it's not someone on, you know, the inside they're not part of the cold, the cold I guess, you know, right. um, and vice versa, because this, this obviously isn't just a problem in gymnastics or even just ice skating, but uh, we're trying to fight for changes for, for youth sports altogether. Right, and wouldn't it be great if USA Gymnastics does become the model for, yeah. you know, and, and here's the other thing about USA Gymnastics. They have to acknowledge, which they don't in any kind of bylaws, anything, that 90% of their athletes are children in USA Gymnastics. There is no um, accommodation made for the fact that 90% of their members are children. And that's not true for any other sport in, in the Olympics. But they don't really make any other kind of, which makes me crazy. Mm -hmm. Gwen? Um, you, got to, you got to compete in college because you maintained your amateur status. Do you think that if the NCAA got rid of its amateur rules, that it would offer more opportunities for young girls to go on and keep competing until they were 21 or 22, even if they weren't necessarily international caliber, and that that might give the, that might help a little bit because it would elongate their careers mm. until they were more like adults? I haven't really. It's a good question. I probably need to think about it a little more. Um, yeah, I think I'm. In one way, it might, but as long as the same system to be an elite is 
in place, that I feel like it's still going to have, you know, that, that fear that if you don't train with these coaches, then you're not going to have a chance. Because the, I, I think what you mean is if you go off to college and... Or you know that's there. It's There's there, but system, you also have to it. play the politics in the sport right now, too. That's the problem they're choosing. So, I mean, there's there's a couple athletes right now who are coming forward that were abused, and they're really scared it's going to hurt their chance on being on the Olympic team because they're speaking up. And and that's what I'm talking about. So it's it's really hard. And they, there's some that already think that that happened. Like going, There's some that have gone off to college, and... There's a couple of them that felt like they were taken off the Olympic team because they were speaking up. So I don't, I don't know. Well, that brings up, I'm sorry. The second question is the selection process. There's always been this argument that the U.S. does in a lot of sports. You finish in the top two or three, and then you go, and it doesn't matter how you perform before. But there are also sports where there's this, let's pick the best team. It doesn't just matter how they finish at the trials. Do you think that saying if you finish in the top two or the top three in the trials, then you go regardless of your history and the coaches don't get to choose who's on the team? No, no I, I actually think I like the selection process as far as having individual like event specialists. Uh -huh. uh, I think that's, I think it's smart. And that when you're putting, when you want to put up the best team to compete against other countries, then I think it's really smart to be able to select the team. The problem is, is who's selecting the team. So if you get the right people in there that are actually trying to be fair um, and not play so many politics or be abusive, I think that you know the, the selection process could make a lot of sense. Did you have a question there? Well, I really had a comment. Um, I wrote a book about female athletes called Sisterhood in Sports. Oh. And um, one of the things I do with women, I wrote a chapter on the eating disorders and um, I'm writing a new book about stand up and shout out women in sport demand equality with a substantial chapter on abuse. But I think the abuse issue is so widespread among so many sports unless the USOC makes significant changes that trickles down mm -hmm. into club teams and other levels of sport. Uh, we're going to be struggling quite a bit, and that really concerns me around abuse. Um, I'm happy to see, are you aware of championwomen.org? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, this is a former Olympian who's an attorney that worked for the Women's Sports Foundation for years, and she's established, it's a legal organization for helping uh, girls and women in sport who've been abused. Um, so the representation, so there's a consciousness about it. And the other thing that Nancy Maker, um, Hogshed Maker, oh, is, Nancy. you know, she's going after USOC, which mm -hmm. helps us. But I think not only in gymnastics, but if you look at multiple other sports, this abuse of power has gone on far too long. I, I read your book back, I bought and read your book back in 95. And um, I've seen women are abused in so many ways in sport. You know, they're abused in the, it, it's that power balance that's not there that we need more of to be able to prevent. You know, I, I kind of theorize why do, um, why doesn't the USOC ever put a woman in charge? Would that have helped the situation? Well, there is now. Yeah. 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 There is now. Yes. So, uh, I'm going to get a couple more questions. <coughs> sure, sure. I'm sorry. sorry. But that's sorry. okay. But thank you for sh thank you for sharing that. I mean, you had your hand up. Yeah. Um, Jamie, with all your trips to Washington and all of the things that you want to do and going to gyms, is there some sort of an organization that's funding you people to do these things, or are you all doing this on your with your own money? Hmm. I mean, how are how is there any way that we can all like somehow contribute to the process? Oh. Well, thank, thank you. you. Right now, though, it's um, more of, of a legal case going on. So um, I think my attorney has like 150 clients. So his firm, um, 
you, they, they, they foot the bill. For, yeah. for your child? Oh, yeah. Stuff. Good. Okay. Yeah. And we definitely are kind of the answer, but like we're definitely fighting USOC as well. Um, and like she said, it's, it's not just about gymnastics. I only speak from my experience in gymnastics, but we're definitely fighting for, for all, all sports. My question is kind of part B to yours, which is, is there a restitution fund for counseling for the athletes that, that were at the NASA? <coughs> I, I'm not sure. I think I think there is. Um, yeah, it's a Michigan State. Uh, Michigan. Five hundred million they had put aside for all of the gymnasts, not even not just okay. the ones that were in Michigan. Is that right? Well, they have a, a ten million dollar fund just for therapy or psychological support. Just for therapy. In addition yeah. to the case that reports on. Yeah, I have a great therapist, so. <laughs> <laughs> but it is great that Michigan State stepped up yeah. way before USA Gymnastics or the USFC is even thinking about it. Yeah. Oh, can I get to somebody sure. who hasn't asked a question? Nancy? So, I want to go back to the first, your personal story. When I read in the papers about the nature of the abuse, they said that sometimes your mothers were in the same room as the doctor was abusing you, and I couldn't imagine how that happened. Yeah, um, that didn't happen in my case because um, I think that was more on Michigan or where he would abuse children at uh, Twist Stars in Michigan. So my mother was never in the room. But I think with, with a predator, um, people have to understand this is what they live every waking moment getting good at and they study human behavior, and they put every bit of energy into being really good at what they do. And so I know it's, I think it's difficult for, for <coughs> anyone to understand that because that's, that's not who we are. But for him, it, I think he got away with it because like, even as a mother, they, you, you trust the doctor too. You're not, you're not looking for those things. And so I think that's part of, you know, bringing up the, the consciousness, like they said, and bringing more awareness. And it's better to be safe than sorry. So you need to educate and, you know, bring more awareness, awareness to the issue, even for the parents. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the moms, it's, it's sad. Like, of course the parents feel like they didn't protect their, their children. Right, and that's the, the one thing that, that really struck me when I would go to the gyms and I would talk to talk to people is that when you're in this really strange subculture that is so foreign to you that the abnormal becomes normal so you think oh this is just the way it's done here so like it would set off alarm bells to most parents right but in that weird little culture and you get deeper and deeper into it that these parents and kids and everybody is thinking, okay, this is normal here. Mm -hmm. And you're not participating in the outside world anymore. You're not, most of the girls are not going to school. The parents are sitting and watching them in the gym and sitting with the other parents who are, you know, crazier than you are. So you have to say, yeah, I'm bad, but God, she's really bad. You know, so you can kind of rationalize everything. That probably can be well, that too. But yeah. a good example of that too, because I thought about this, um, it's not like my parents didn't warn me about sexual predators and abuse. And um, had that happened in elementary school to me or in school, I would have told my parents. I still can't wrap my head around that completely. But I know had that happened in school, I would have told my parents. And that's how, like you said, my reality was so, was so messed up that I never even thought about telling them. I never even realized what he was doing was wrong. Okay, a couple more questions, Mark. Yeah, Joan, I, I don't remember uh, where the Corollis sat at the time in your the time of the book. So, what what, what place did they play in, in the at the time of the book? And then I'm curious about what you both think about their level of culpability and the ranch's role and and all of this. Well, I'll be really short because you you know you have personal experience, but. Um, well, I remember it took me a year to get the interview with Bella for the book, which, you know, in retrospect was the best thing that could have happened, because by the time I sat down with him, I had chapter and verse of, you know, dozens <coughs> of girls and parents 
telling me exactly what had happened with him in the gym. Never sexual abuse, but horrible emotional and physical abuse, which is, you know, all in the book. I don't want to go into the details now. But when I sat with him, and we, I think it was like three hours, I sat with him in his office at the gym. The ranch wasn't open yet. It wasn't. Quite yet, yeah. So it was at his Houston gym. And, you know, anybody who has seen him on television, you just know how charismatic this guy is. And he's smiling, and you sit there and like, I totally got it. I totally got why girls would be enthralled <laughs> with him and just do anything to get him to smile at you and give you a compliment. And we actually had this really nice three hours because, I mean, and this is all my journalist friends over here, you know, like you know that there's no reason to be confrontational. That's not going to do me any good. So it was just like, okay, Bella, so-and-so says this happened. What's your recollection of that? Okay, why would she say that then? You know, so you go chapter and verse through the whole thing, three and a half hours, we're done, walks me out to the parking lot, you know, nobody else is there, shows me, you know, to my car, and he gives me a kiss on the cheek. And, and you know, it was like out of The Godfather. You know, I was thinking, oh my God, jeez, let me just get my car and get out of here. And then what happened was when the book came out, uh, and I remember this, USA Today did a story on it, and talked to Bella, and he swore he never talked to me. <laughs> of course, you know, I have my tape recorder on there, and I was like, I know he's not stupid. So he knew, like, my tape recorder. And my theory is that he couldn't reconcile that nice young woman sitting in his office for three hours with this person who wrote this scathing expose that he was, uh, you know, eviscerated in. So, but what was your experience with him? And then we got to wrap it up. Oh, I mean, it was pretty much what I was saying earlier. The ranch was awful. I used to get sick to my stomach um, every time I had to go there. But same thing, just they, they starved us. We weren't allowed to talk. We weren't allowed um, Bella would come in sometimes and it was like that. You just wanted him to even notice you or like you. And then if he did, you didn't want to be in trouble by him in some way or, you know, disappoint him or Marta. I mean, or any of the national staff. But, I mean, I think they're, they need to be held accountable too. I was going to say, what do you think the chances are of you getting another interview with him now? <laughs> <laughs> Can I go? Maybe not. I know. You know what? We should go together. We should. We should go together. I'm down. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's see. We have a camera with us. 60 minutes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I know we're, we're over our time. Um, Cheryl, did you want to say anything? Or, or uh, yeah, I we're going to be signing books? I just want right to thank everyone for coming.